Well, we're continuing our study this morning in the book of Acts. We, um, we've actually had two, two messages related to the book of Acts, and we're not even the first verse yet. So uh, the first uh, teaching was on the, the words of Jesus, the promises of Christ in, in the upper room discourse regarding the Holy Spirit. And last week we, we uh, had an introduction to the book, and today we're actually in earnest going to be starting uh, the first 11 verses. And so I'd like to read it and ask uh, for God's favor on it uh, right after we read it, but I'd like to read from Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John was baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we ask that you would bless the teaching of your word. I pray, God, that you would take the preparation that I've made, and God, that you would infuse it with power and with truth, God, with your glory, and with words of encouragement and hope. God, that you would inspire us to walk with you more closely than ever before. And God, that you would take the simple thoughts that you've put on my heart to, to share, to bring clarity to this text, and that you would use them, God, to further and advance your kingdom, not only in the lives of people listening, but my own ears as well. God, we want to follow you. We want to be a part of this great commission that you've given the church. We want to be a part of this great work that you have planned and the, uh, the purpose that you have for each of us to be a part of that plan. And so, God, we surrender ourselves even before we get into the text this morning and say, God, we want you to have your way. We want to yield ourselves to you. We want to confess sin and repent of anything that would hinder your work. And we want to ask, God, that you would advance forcefully the work that you have in our lives personally, but also in this church and even more importantly, in this world. And so here we are, Lord, very simple people, but coming with great expectation and great joy. Open our hearts and open our minds and teach us wonderful things out of your law this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. I have to begin this morning by giving a bit of an explanation for the title of the message, which I've entitled The Incarnation Part 2. And uh, maybe another way to, to remove any confusion is to call it the second incarnation. Incarnation is actually not a word that's found in the Bible. It's a Latin word. It comes from a compound phrase, incarnate, in, meaning in, which is a, a word that we're familiar with, incarnate, which, or carne, which has to do with flesh. And so incarnate means in the flesh. And what we have in the first incarnation of Jesus Christ was um, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit in relationship to Mary conceiving a child that was both God and, and man at the same time. And so Jesus, we're told in Philippians, humbled himself, took on human flesh, and became obedient even to the point of death. This incarnation was so shocking to the New Testament church that even though the prophecies all explained and predicted and foreshadowed what was going to come, they didn't understand it even when it happened. It was confusing to them. It was something that they never, ever expected, the, the possibility of God himself becoming man was so beneath God and so shocking that even to this day, 
It's, it's astonishing to consider that God himself took on human flesh. In fact, Martin Luther described it this way. He said, the mystery of the humanity of Christ, that he sunk himself into our flesh, is beyond all human understanding. I was thinking about this, and I was trying to imagine how to possibly describe the inappropriate the human perspective, action of God becoming man. It's kind of like putting the Mona Lisa in a Macy's bag. Now, I say a Macy's bag because God was perfect in Christ in his fleshly life. He never sinned. And so he's a lot better than, than our lives. And so we find that, that God took on human flesh, but it's like putting a, a treasure, a priceless treasure in a Macy's bag. You don't, you don't put a tri- priceless treasure in a Macy's bag. They don't have priceless treasures at Macy's. It's the nicest store we have on the island, but they don't have priceless treasures there. You get your stuff, you put your 40, 50 buck shirt in there or whatever it is, can't believe how much shirts cost or whatever, and you put your stuff in the bag, and, and you, you know, even with that, you don't set it down anywhere, right? We've got a safe island. Nobody steals around here, hardly. Um, but you don't even put your bag down and just walk away from it while you go into Jamba Juice. You know, you keep the bag with you. But God came in human flesh, in, in like a Macy's bag. And he lived among us. That's completely shocking that God would do something like that. But there's something actually more shocking than that. And that's the second incarnation. You're thinking, what is he talking about? Well, incarnation is really the gracious, voluntary act of the Son of God taking on human flesh. And this is the second incarnation. It's the gracious, voluntary act of the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, taking up residence in the heart of human flesh. But it's even worse and more shocking because we aren't Macy's bags. We're like crumpled up, used 10 times over Walmart bags. That's what we are. And God took up residence in our flesh. We're not perfect. We talked about this last week and the week before, that why Jesus said that he had to go first and be at the Father's right hand before the Holy Spirit could be sent. Why? Because we were unclean. We were filled with sin. And God said that he can't dwell in sin. He can't have fellowship with sin. So he had Christ come in the flesh and perform an atoning work on the cross at Calvary. And there he paid for our sins, for mine and yours, so that we might be purified. The same thing that had to happen in the tabernacle, in the temple of Solomon. Anytime a temple was built or a tabernacle was set up, there had to be a cleansing and a purification and sacrifice in order to remove any stain of sin from that place of worship. And we know that Jesus, when he died on the cross, removed the stain of sin for anyone that would receive him and cry out to him who would believe in his name. And once that sin was removed, then the Holy Spirit could take residence up. Just like, it, like he did in the Old Testament. When they make the sacrifice at the tabernacle, the, the Shekinah glory of God, either in a fire or in cloud, would, would come and settle upon the temple. And so Jesus had to, had to go first. He had to leave, finishing and completing his entire work of salvation and redemption and atonement so that the Holy Spirit could be sent into the lives of of paper bag people. Paul puts it this way. We don't don't speak in the same language, but in essence, he says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He says we have this treasure in jars of clay. That was their cheapest, most common vessel was a jar of clay. And he said we have this incredible ultimate treasure and it's taken up residence in jars of clay. Well, we're Walmart bags, 10 times used over. That's what we are. And God has taken up residence. And so the first incarnation is spoken of all the time from pulpits and churches and in the Bible. But one of the things that we don't think much of is the the second incarnation, that the third person of the Trinity also has taken on human flesh and taken up residence in the hearts of, of men and women. This is phenomenal. Even as I'm talking about it now, I'm just, I'm, I'm speechless. My, my greatest prayer this morning was that God would somehow give me the capacity to explain and to, and to communicate to you the things that have been impacting my heart as a result of this study. And I, I honestly don't know how to do it right. I can tell you right now I'm not going to succeed to my satisfaction because I think that the things I'm talking about can't be fully appreciated by anybody and certainly not completely properly communicated 
with human language, the privilege that we have being fallen people and yet atoned for, redeemed, cleansed, and now having God Almighty taking up residence inside of our hearts. And this is the amazing thing, is that Luke's first gospel is about the first incarnation. And his second book, the book of Acts, or the second volume of a two-volume series, is about the second incarnation. The first book, the first incarnation, was about Jesus' teaching, Jesus' work, Jesus' ministry. And the second book is about God's continuing work through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, who's taken up residence in Walmart bag people to continue the work of ministry. He begins this section of the text with a summary of Christ's earthly ministry. He says that he refers, first of all, to the pre-resurrection ministry as he talks to Theophilus and writes to Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up and until he gave instruction through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that he begins this way because he says all that Jesus began to do and teach. Well, it gives the sense that the work isn't finished yet. But we know from Jesus' own words, one of his famous seven phrases on the cross is, it is finished. But he wasn't referencing salvation in terms of everyone hearing the gospel. He was referencing the atoning work of Christ on the cross, that that was completed. There was no further sacrifice necessary. But the job of ministry was far from done. And so Luke says, all the things that Jesus began to do and teach, he recorded in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. But there was more to be done. And I find it interesting that whether you're talking about the gospel of Luke or the book of Acts, the incarnation is God's secret strategy to change the world. And so we find that, uh, that God, when he's working, uses this very simple strategy of indwelling first a, a body, man, God-man, Jesus Christ, and then secondly, taking the existing bodies that we have that he's created, they're created in the image of God, created for fellowship with God, and he wants us to go out and do the works that Jesus did. Now, this is the thing that I want to share with you, is that we've got to be so careful, and I'm even thinking about this now as I'm, as I'm sharing with you, the importance of not being in the way of the work of God, because the thing that has the greatest impact on people around us is not us, but it's Christ in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So the objective of every Christian should be to allow more and more of the third person of the Trinity to shine through our lives. That, that there's like a glowing that's taking place inside this Walmart bag that we are. And it's so bright and so amazing that it's just, it's visible to anybody around us, that there's something happening in us that makes us different, though the bag is, is uh, wrinkled and a little dirty, that nonetheless, there's something happening inside of us that is a testimony to the power of God. And so even as Jesus was filled with the Spirit and was guided and directed by the Spirit, so much so that he said, not one word that I've ever spoken has ever come from me. It's all come from the Father. Not one thing I've ever done was initiated by me. It was initiated by God the Father. And the Holy Spirit speaking to the Son as he prayed and sought the Lord, informed him and instructed him and came alongside to show him what he must do. That's why the writer of Hebrews said that he was made in every way like we are, yet without sin. Why? So that he could set a pattern for us of what our lives should look like. I don't know what this does for you, but what it does for me is it makes me realize the exalted and high position that we have in Christ. That we're not just people that, that accepted and believed certain truths about Jesus Christ and now we're trying our hardest just to be nice people until Christ comes back. And that as we're trying to be nice people, that, that people will be affected by our niceness. No, that's not what's happening. What's happening is that you have been invested with God himself, the third person of the Trinity, taking up residence in your heart. And if we allow him, if I allow him, if you allow him to have his way, he is going to shine and, and uh, be so evident in your life that people will be drawn to Christ because of what's happening, not in your life particularly, but in your life because of the Holy Spirit. And do you see why it's so important that we not ignore the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit? I know I've talked about this many times, but there's a, there's a tendency in the church today to, to either ignore the Holy Spirit because we're afraid of him and we've seen abuses of him, or to, to 
ascribe to the Holy Spirit really ridiculous teachings and ridiculous behavior and chalk it up to to being a spirit-led and spirit-filled person. But somewhere in between is the center that God wants us to live in, acknowledging the Holy Spirit, having fellowship with the Holy Spirit, allowing him to work in our lives in such a way that we realize that we're, we're vessels of the indwelling power of God. And because of that, God can use us to carry on and to complete the work that Jesus began. We're not God. We are created in the image of God. We are sons and daughters of God. But God has lifted us to this high position so much so that he calls us brothers, so much so that he calls us co-heirs with Christ, co-laborers. And all of this starts to make sense when you realize, and I realize, that what Jesus began, he has called us to continue on with this second incarnation of his presence in the third person of the Trinity, in our lives in such a way that we are able to carry on the work that God has called us to, and we can only do it, obviously, by the power of the Spirit of God. And so Luke begins this section just summarizing, as any good teacher would. A lot of the kids are going back to school right now, and what are they going to do for the first few weeks of school? They're going to review what they forgot over the summer or over the holidays. And, uh, and so Luke begins, and he gives a, a review of Jesus' pre-resurrection Uh, ministry, and then his post-resurrection ministry, because it said he showed himself to his disciples, and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. What were those proofs? Well, I'll go over them briefly. The first proof is that he appeared to over 500 people over a period of 40 days. Paul, when he was uh, writing 1 Corinthians 15, said that, that Jesus appeared to Mary, to many of the women. He appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. He appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the very same time. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And Paul, in humility, says that last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now, you can chalk up one person thinking they saw Jesus as a hallucination. But when you have Jesus appearing for a period of 40 days to all kinds of different people, even as, uh, as Luke says, many of whom are still alive... Paul said, many of whom are still alive. If you don't believe me, in essence, what Paul is saying, go check with them. They can tell you that it wasn't a a hallucination. It wasn't a a bad dinner. It wasn't a nightmare. But we're talking about the risen Christ coming and revealing himself in physical form to many, many people. The second evidence that, that, uh, that Luke gives here for the convincing proofs, the resurrection of Jesus, is that he spoke to them, Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Now, most people, when they hallucinate, aren't having instruction time out of the Bible. But that's what what Luke is saying was happening for those 40 days, that he kept teaching them and teaching them and, and probably preparing them for this great transition that was about to take place in the ministry, that he was passing the mantle on of leadership for this great work of preaching the gospel. And so he taught about the kingdom of God. Now, I find it very interesting that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. I mean, how many thousands of things could Jesus have taught about? If I'd been Jesus, if I'd been a disciple, I'd want to know eschatology. I'd want to know all about the end times. I'd want to know more details, and and they're actually going to ask about that. But Jesus said, what you need to know is about the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus taught extensively about the kingdom of God in the Gospels. He taught with parables. He taught um, uh, from the Old Testament. He taught in every conceivable way to try to explain to the disciples what the kingdom of God is like. But they still didn't get it. Because when they thought kingdom, they thought an earthly reign and realm. But in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who asked them the same question, when is the kingdom of God going to come? When is the earthly reign of the kingdom of all kingdoms going to take place on earth. And this is what Jesus said. The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is. In other words, it's not the kind of kingdom when you can say, finally, we have them back on the throne. Finally, we have our nation. Finally, we have borders. This kingdom cannot be observed and it can't be identified as there it is or here it is. And why? Because Jesus said, because the kingdom of God is within you. See, the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is reigning and ruling in the hearts of men and women. The kingdom of God is wherever the spirit of God has taken up residence. That's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom. 
And so in essence, what Jesus was saying is every one of you are a part of that kingdom of God. You are, you are a representative of the kingdom of God. You are citizens of the kingdom, but you also are intact representatives of the kingdom because the spirit of God doesn't live in us collectively, but he lives in us individually. He works collectively, but he's abiding individually in the hearts of men and women. And so you are a part of that kingdom. The third thing that that Luke presents as a convincing proof is that Jesus ate with the disciples. And he mentions that briefly in this text, and he says more about that in Luke 24. When Jesus first appeared to the disciples, they were completely afraid and shocked. They thought he was a ghost. And, and what Jesus said is, hey, come on, put your hands on me. You know, flesh and blood, I'm not a ghost. I am arisen. I have come back, even as I said I would. And so they, they touched him and they realized, but they still weren't convinced. They were still afraid. And so interestingly in this text in Luke, Jesus says, do you guys have anything to eat? And it wasn't because Jesus was hungry, but it was because he wanted to prove that he was not a ghost because ghosts don't eat. And so, well, there are no such thing as ghosts anyway, but, in, but even in that culture, the idea that ghosts would eat, they don't eat. And so, so they, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and they're all like, is he going to eat it? Is he going to eat it? Because they knew that that would be one of the final convincing proofs. And so Jesus ate this fish and he was just like, oh no, that was good. You know, he enjoyed himself. He liked it. And, and from that point on, the disciples, though, the, though they, before this time, were un uncertain and they, you know, we know about uh, doubting Thomas. From that point on, there was never, ever again a question of the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, from that point on, they began to preach fearlessly the resurrection of Christ. And so that's what Luke covers, the uh, convincing proofs. But then he gets to the command of Christ in, uh, in verse 4 on an occasion when he was eating with them again. And, uh, and Jesus says to them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift promised by the Father and spoken of by Jesus. So they're to wait for something. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting that much. And uh, I don't really like waiting in line. I don't like waiting in the traffic. I don't, there are a lot of things. I'm learning how to redeem those times and make them valuable for the kingdom, but it's not my preference to wait. I've got certain things that I've been praying for for years, and I still don't have answers for. And I'm still waiting. Some of you today, I know, are waiting. I know some of you are waiting for certain things that you really have a need for and you're crying out to God for and your heart's broken. There are things that have happened in your life and you're looking to God and you're waiting. And it's the hardest assignment I think that sometimes God can ever give a person is waiting, trusting. I like what David says. He says, wait on the Lord. He says, you will yet see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, keep waiting, keep trusting. We have a lot of examples of, of impatience in the Bible, not the least of which is Saul, uh, when Samuel said, wait for seven days and I'll come, and, and Saul couldn't wait, and, uh, and he went ahead and made an inappropriate sacrifice in 1 Samuel, and the result is, is that it was the beginning of the end of his kingdom. Waiting is difficult. I think the reason Jesus said wait is because by nature, the disciples at this point felt probably a real pressure to do something. You know, they'd failed so many times already. And now that they saw the resurrected Lord and he was commissioning them and everything, he's there, okay, Lord, you're going to be proud of us now. We're going to get out there. We're going to tear it up. We don't even know what to do, but we're going to tear it up. Just let us at it. You know, just get out of the way. We're going. And Jesus says, no, you can't do that. You have to wait. And so here are all these guys that are, that are all fired up and they've got one of the most incredible messages that the world has ever received, ever could receive, ever could give or deliver, and they have to wait. Sometimes life is like that. And some of you are waiting now. And, and uh, here's my encouragement to you. They had to wait 10 days. It might not be that long that God's going to answer your prayers. I don't know why I've had to wait like, you know, 3,422 days on some of my prayers, but that's just the way it is. But I'm learning that the waiting process is, is really an important part of my own personal growth. But, uh, but he says what the, promised, uh, the Father has promised, which, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, when did, when did God the Father promise the Holy Spirit? You might be surprised by the answer because we find prophecies in Joel, you know, where he says, I'm going to pour out on all flesh my, my spirit. And, you know, the young men are going are, uh, are to dream dreams. The old men, all these things are going to happen. Prophecy is going to take place, even women, uh, as if that's, you know, some shock. But the women and men are all going to experience this outpouring. But that's not the first time God mentions the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
The first mention of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Spirit is actually all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 with a promise to Abraham. Now that might surprise you, but let me read the text. Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3. God speaking to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's the first promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we have in the Bible. And you're thinking, wait a second, that doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit. Well, you would be right. We're not exactly told what that blessing would be. I think most of us would think that that blessing would be salvation, wouldn't you say? The Messiah and salvation. You'd only be partly right. Because Paul the Apostle in Galatians chapter 3, verse 14, actually interprets this verse and tells us what it actually means. This is what Paul says, referring to Christ. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? So he says he redeemed us in order that the blessing might be given. See, I, I was thinking all this time that it was the redemption work of Christ that was the blessing. But the redemption was only the avenue by which the blessing would come. The redemption, the atoning work of Christ is what was required to cleanse the temple. But the cleansing of the temple wasn't the blessing. It was when the Holy Spirit entered the temple that the blessing came. And so Jesus Christ on the cross, this is so phenomenal. He died, redeemed us in order that the blessing promised to Abraham that would come to all nations could come, that blessing being the second incarnation of God in the third person of the Trinity, indwelling man and woman. This is amazing. And so this blessing is for everyone. And, and he said, God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. How? Because he was going to be so nice to everybody? Well, that's part of it, but that's not really it. It was that Abraham would be a forerunner foreshadowing this indwelling presence of God. Now, we know that there are many times in the Old Testament where we have the Holy Spirit coming upon pers a person or filling them or using them in a dynamic way, almost in a New Testament kind of a way. But the thing is, is that it was only with a select few and it was only with Jews. And so we find that now in the New Testament, the promise that was given to Abraham is finally brought to fruition. And the redemptive work of Christ cleanses our lives, though we're sinful and wicked before Christ cleans us and makes us an appropriate, holy vessel, a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's the blessing. It's the Holy Spirit in us that makes us a blessing to other people. And so that's why Jesus spoke so frequently of the, of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes we think of the Holy Spirit simply as, you know, kind of our go-go juice, you know, and, and we call him it and things like that. We, we think of the Holy Spirit as a force to get the job done. No, the Holy Spirit himself is the one that gets the job done. He's the one that works in us. It, it, he's not a, a power that we harness and that we knock people down with and that we, you know, perform tricks with. The Holy Spirit is the, is the indwelling presence of God such that we're, we're, we become less and less and he becomes greater and greater. The less we become and the greater he becomes, the more power that we have in ministry because he is more evident. He's shining through more clearly than ever before. And that incarnation, even as Jesus, people recognized there was something different about him. But it wasn't his flesh and blood that made him different because the Bible says he was just a normal average guy. But it was what was taking place in his heart. And it's the same for us as believers. This, this presence of the Holy Spirit, by the way, was foreshadowed by the work of John the Baptist, who baptized, which means to immerse, means to submerge. It was fun to do that this last week with a, with a number of people, a real blessing. But John says of himself, hey, I'm simply baptizing with water. This isn't going to change your life. It's for repentance from sins. It's that cleansing work. It's that redeeming work of, of calling people to get things right with God. But it's the baptism of the Spirit that is the blessing, the indwelling of God. And so John the Baptist says that you will be indwelt, baptized with the Holy Spirit. One of the things that, uh, that's sometimes misunderstood in the church, and, and uh, there are a variety of views on this, and I don't want to get tangled up in it too much except to say that 
I think the Bible makes it very clear that if you have accepted Christ, you have already received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I remember as a young believer, I was so excited about Christ. I was working at Hopeco Stationers and, and, uh, and I was working with all of the corporate accounts and, and uh, one, some guy came up and I saw it was from a church and I just accepted Christ, you know, just you know, months before and I was all on fire. And I said, wow, you're a, are you the pastor? Yeah, I'm the pastor, you know. And I said, man, I just, I'm a Christian, you know, I just accepted Christ. And he said, well, that's great news. And I said, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm, I, I've got so much love in my heart. I feel so blessed by being forgiven and I'm just trying to tell everybody I can about him. And, uh, and this kind of somber look came across his face and he said, well, he says, I'm really happy for you, but have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I knew right away that he was communicating to me that I was in some way inferior, that I'd, I was missing something in my life. And I struggled with that whole thing and I went to the Bible and found out what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 9, is that you cannot receive Christ without receiving the Spirit of Christ. In other words, you can't be half a believer. You can't receive Christ and then the Holy Spirit's out here hovering until you figure out what you're supposed to do and the secret you know, chant that you're supposed to chant in order to get him to come in. That's not how it works. When we receive Christ... He comes in, forgives us, and instantaneously the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God, if you want to think of it in that way, from the Old Testament picture, settles in our hearts and we are permanently indwelt by his presence because we are permanently cleansed by the redeeming work of Christ. And so if you're a believer, you already are filled with God. You are already indwelt by the Spirit of God, but that doesn't mean that you are empowered or experiencing that incarnation of God. He's in you, but you may not be experiencing the joy that he's designed to produce in your life. And so there are certain things that I want to talk about in just a moment in relationship to the filling of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about in Ephesians. But suffice it to say that if you have received Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians that you have been given a deposit at that moment guaranteeing that you are an inheritor of eternal life, and that deposit is the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful relief for me many years ago when I studied that and found that out. And I realized, you know, I'm not incomplete. There may be more that the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life. And undoubtedly that was true and continues to be true. But he has already taken up residence in me. I'm not somehow half a believer or halfway there. But God has done a complete work in my heart as he has in yours as well. Well, the disciples, shortly after Jesus says this in, uh, in verse 6, they ask a question that I remember as a younger Christian reading this thought, man, these guys are just way out here somewhere. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit and they say, so when is the kingdom going to be restored? When is Israel going to become a nation again? And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is right up there with who's the greatest. But the reality is, is those two questions make sense if you know the Old Testament prophecies. Because in the book of Ezekiel and also in the book of Joel, when the Holy Spirit is mentioned, the coming of the Spirit, the, the historic es eschatology that's laid out by those prophets, in other words, the historic prediction of the future is so condensed that the Holy Spirit's coming is associated almost immediately with the restoration of Israel. And so when Jesus is talking to the disciples about the coming of the, of the Holy Spirit, that he's just about here, just wait a few days and that kind of thing, that they're thinking, wow, if you look in Ezekiel 36 and if you look in, um, in Joel chapter 2, it's immediately after that that the kingdom's restored. Now do you understand a little bit better why the disciples are saying, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be in that kingdom? Because Jesus is continually, incessantly toward the end of his ministry talking about this second incarnation of the Holy Spirit, which they didn't fully understand. But they knew if the Holy Spirit was coming and there was going to be a baptism and an outpouring, that the next step in the eschatology of, of, of end time things would be the restoration of Israel. Does this start to make more sense why they're asking the question now? So it's actually a very logical question. But Jesus gives them an answer that, um, you know, isn't always satisfying to any of us. He says, it's not for you to know. He answers by deflecting their question. It's not for you to know the times or the dates. And I'm like, oh, again, I don't know the times or dates, you know. I'd like to know so many times and dates. I mean, if I could know the times and dates, man, I'd, man, I'd, I'd be able to hang on with more faith because I know the answer is coming. 
If I knew the times and dates, I'd know how much, how much uh, uh, perseverance I have to have. And I, and I could tell, I could bless people. Boy, if I knew times and dates, I could, our whole church could be rich. You know, I mean, I'd know everything about everything. I'd know when the market's going up. I'd know when it's going down. I, I'd be able to explain with authority all the things in, 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 the, in the Bible that I don't have answers for and that aren't clearly explained. I mean, it would be phenomenal. So I'm thinking, why wouldn't God want the disciples to know the times and dates of the coming of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Well, I've got a few reasons, and they're, they're, they're my thoughts. There are probably many others. But I think the first benefit of not knowing is that, boy, I tell you, I'm dependent on God. I just have to hang on in prayer. I don't know when the answer is coming. It could be next week. It could be five years from now. I might not get the answer until I'm on my deathbed for some of the prayers I'm praying. But the fact is, is that all of that lack of information makes me a person on my knees in prayer even more. Because if I knew the answers, I wouldn't need to pray. I think another reason that, that Jesus didn't tell the disciples, and he couldn't because he himself doesn't know, was to establish and maintain an urgency to preach the gospel. Do you know that the Bible tells us uh, from the text of this scripture that it was from uh, Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, to Rome, to the ends of the earth. And in 30 short years, they accomplished the mission of getting the gospel all the way to Rome. Now, what if... Jesus had answered their question and said, well, you know, it's going to be at least 2,100 years before Christ comes back, before I'm coming back. But don't, don't let that dissuade you. You guys need to get going. Has anyone ever been given a responsibility for a term paper in college and said, you have to write it, and I would really encourage you to get it started. It's due in 10 years. <laughs> How many of you would be cracking the books the first day in the library, sweating bullets over the paper? None of us. And so Jesus doesn't tell us. So thankfully, these guys had an urgency thinking that Jesus was going to come back right away. And by the way, even though all these years have passed, all of the prophecies necessary for the, for the rapture of the church have been fulfilled. And I believe we're on the, the precipice. I think we're very close to the second coming of Christ. But I think if they had known these things, it would have uh, taken away the sense of urgency. And if you've ever watched any sky-fi movies, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, the, the future, Back to the Future, for instance, an old movie uh, that maybe some of you have seen, is that if you think you know what's supposed to happen in the time of it, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to meddle. You're going you're to get in the way. And so Jesus says it's not for you to know these things. There's a really interesting verse in Deuteronomy 29, 29 that says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. In other words, there are certain things that we're just never going to know. And I want to tell you, it's a gift of God that we don't know. It's a gift that I don't know. So many things that I'd like to have answers for, but it's a gift that I don't. I have to put my trust in God that he has not revealed those things to me for his own divine purposes, and at the very least, to make me a man who cries out to him in prayer and is looking to him moment by moment instead of getting the, the week-long schedule in advance and then just going by the schedule all week and then next week finding out what I'm supposed to do. But every day, every moment, I have to cry out because I don't know what's on the heart of God until he informs me, until he shows me. And his real point isn't to make us slavenly um, dependent upon him, but what he wants is a relationship. And time frames and dates remove the possibility of that development of relationship with him. And so knowing our weakness, he's been so gracious to us to not tell us everything that he could tell us. But it says on this verse that continues, but the re things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of his law. In other words, there are many, many, many things that he has revealed to us and those things that he has revealed, we need to walk in, we need to obey. So there may be some of you here today that, that know certain things are not right in your life and things that God has revealed and he just made it absolutely crystal clear. This is sin, this is inappropriate, this will not be something I bless. And he says, I want you to make it right. I want you to live. You're, we're worried about times and dates of things that we don't know. And already God has given us things that we do know and we haven't walked in it. And if that's the case, God is calling us and saying, walk in obedience, repent of sin, do it today, don't wait. You have no idea what's at stake. You have no idea the consequences, the ultimate consequences, the loss, that, that diminished influence of the Holy Spirit, that diminished uh, power of God's, person, the third person of the Trinity working in you through this second incarnation will be diminished by sin. You'll be missing out on so many things. And so the secret things belong to God. Let's concentrate on taking care of the things that we already know are right, that God has said and wrong in our life and act on those things. 
And so a good policy for anything that we don't understand is leave it to God and in the things that we do understand, obey God. Well, Jesus, after deflecting their question, redirects their focus back to the Holy Spirit and he says, you are going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. We already have talked about the fact that a person that receives and believes in Jesus is already indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But there is a filling that, that, that uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians 5.18. He says, don't be drunk on wine, but he says, be filled. It, it's in the present continuous sense. Be continually on an ongoing basis, moment by moment, filled by the Holy Spirit. It's not that, that, we're, that like the Holy Spirit is draining out of us like a, a cup that's being emptied, but it, this word filling has much more to do with the idea of being consumed by it has to do with the, uh, if you think about being filled with grief or filled with joy or filled with anxiety, it's something that's controlling. It's something that's, that dominates your thought life. That's the sense in which Paul is saying be filled by the Spirit. He's not saying, you know, you drained away, now you need to get filled up again. No, Lord, fill me up again. No, what he's saying is that we need to be controlled and so uh, consumed with God's work in our life that we can't think of anything else except those things. All the other things we have to think about are in our life, they're details, but the consuming thought and passion of our life is this second incarnation of Christ's spirit working in us and that we are filled continually with a desire for him and a, and a passion for his work and that we're on the same page and that we're listening and we're, we're keeping in step with his work. That's what Paul is talking about. Now, how do we do that? I'm gonna just mention two things. One is how you can be filled with the spirit how you can be consumed by him, and secondly, how you can know and see the evidence in a person's life, your own or someone else's, whether they're really filled by the Spirit. These are just, again, these, aren't, these are all out of the Bible, but they're my thoughts that, that I prayed and God gave me, so I'm just gonna share them with you briefly. How you can be filled. Number one is that you absolutely have to be surrendered to God. You have to come to him and say, if you've never accepted Christ, he will not fill you. You will never experience the second incarnation of the third person of the Trinity in your life if you aren't born again because you are not cleansed, you are not pure. He cannot take up residence in a defiled vessel. And the only method, the only strategy that God has ever presented to mankind to cleanse that vessel is redemption through Christ. If you're a believer, you still need that aspect of surrendering your life to God. Because if you are consumed with yourself and your own schedule and your own plans and your own ideas, there's not room for the, the things that God wants you to be consumed with. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit. Let me, let me share something with you that I, that I, I, I share um, even for myself as I thought about this message that was kind of convicting to me. As I thought, how many times in the last week have I cried out to God and said, fill me with your power and your Spirit? Fill me. Let me be consumed by your Holy Spirit. My guess is that most of us have spent an awful lot of time being consumed with what we have planned, ideas that we've got, frustrations we're dealing with, things that we're anxious about. But probably not a lot of us have been on our face before God, crying out and asking God to fill us with his Spirit, to be consumed by his Holy Spirit. And yet that's what is required if we really want to experience that kind of power, that kind of wonderful partnership with the Holy Spirit. And so the first thing that we need to do is to surrender our life. That's what Paul says in Romans 12.1. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. The second thing I've already mentioned is cry out for it. In Luke 11.13, Jesus was talking about evil people and even evil, even evil people can give good gifts to their children. And surprisingly, Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? I think we need to be people that are asking. I think as a regular part of our prayer life, we ought to be saying, hey, not my vessel, your vessel. Your incarnation, it's not my life. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be uh, trying to go the rounds here. I already put it to death at baptism. I put it to death. Uh, Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. We've been bought at a price. It's not our body anymore but it's our purpose and joy to glorify God. So we put the old life to death. We can't reincarnate ourselves and come back in another form in another life saying, no, I want the throne back again. No, it needs to be God's. So we need to cry out to God and say, God, forgive us. Help us to be freed from the desire to be filled with, consumed with, overwhelmed by 
infatuated with our own thoughts and our own ideas, but help us to be filled with your spirit. The third thing is get on board with God's agenda. What is God's agenda for this second incarnation of the third person of the Trinity? It's to continue what Jesus began. It's to continue to work and to teach and to preach and to love and to do in the name of Christ. So God's purpose for the Holy Spirit is to empower us to be able to carry that work on. What's the work? It's to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. So if we're not interested in doing that, then why would God fill us with power? There are a lot of people that want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because they want to have a sensation of presence, of his presence. They want to be near what he's doing. They want to have this uh, emotional experience. And so people follow people around who claim to have the power of the Holy Spirit in ministry or whatever. And, uh, and they become kind of followers of people rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to fill them with power. And so I don't think God has very much interest in empowering people who have no interest in the very purpose for which he sent the Spirit in the first place, which was to carry on the work of ministry. And so it, it may be that if you're lacking power in your life and you're a little bit bored in your Christian life and you're kind of ho-hum and been doing this before, heard this message before, you know, uh, tell me something new, uh, constantly looking for something else and, and losing your desire and your passion for ministry and for quiet time and for, for obeying the Lord and for being passionate for Christ, it could be that what's happening is that you're maybe not on board with the agenda that God has. Because if you're on board with the agenda, you will experience the filling. And when you experience the filling, there's nothing like it. And you never, ever, ever want to go back to a boring Christian life of just trying to be good people, eking out a Christian existence in the midst of a very bad world, you know, hanging on with our fingernails until Christ comes back. God has called us to live the abundant life, a fruitful life to his glory. And it happens when we're on God's page. The fourth thing is saturate yourselves with the words and thoughts of the Holy Spirit as found in the scriptures. Every person in the, in the Trinity was involved in the writing of scripture. But the Holy Spirit was there. And if you want to know his thoughts, you want to know what he cares about, you want to get excited about what he's excited about, then read the Bible. Be people that know the Bible well. And the fifth thing I'll mention briefly is recognize, acknowledge, and cooperate with the Holy Spirit's activity. Galatians 5.25, keep in step with the Spirit. Just start recognizing what he's doing. I want to I share with you briefly evidence of his filling. Some of these overlap, but I'll just share these briefly. I may not even get to the end of the sermon, but that's fine. What's the evidence of the Spirit's filling of that passionate life? Well, the number one evidence of the Spirit's presence in a person's life, the filling, I'm not talking about his indwelling, but I'm talking about that filling that controls a person's life is found in Galatians 5.22. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And what's the number one fruit? Love. That's the number one evidence that someone's born again, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and also filled or consumed with his work is agape love, sacrificial love. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. And many of you are quoting it along with me as I'm sharing it. That, those are the evidences that a person is filled. It's not whether you can knock somebody down. It's not whether you can even heal someone. It's not whether you can speak powerfully. It's not whether you can win people to Christ. It's what's your character like. That's the number one evidence. But another evidence for the fruit of the Spirit, Romans 8 9, is that you have power to overcome the sinful nature. In other words, you're not just continually, repeatedly falling into the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. But there's actually progress. That's not to say we don't struggle, but there's progress in our life. Not perfection, but even as Paul said, let your progress be evident to all. And I think it has to do with self-control and with rejecting and putting away the things that once consumed our lives. And I think a third evidence for the uh, uh, filling of the Holy Spirit is reproductive capacity. The capacity to bear fruit, to reproduce your life in the lives of other people spiritually. So that as you're going through life, you are not just simply getting better and better at knowing about God, 
but you are getting better and better at being a vessel who is informed of God's work, who understands the heart of God because you know the word, and then takes that understanding. The Holy Spirit infuses that understanding with power and passion, with filling, and then you go out, and that work of the incarnation of the third person of the Trinity is so on fire and so aglow in your life that people can't even see you anymore. Now, I'm speaking in, in very graphic and very extreme terms, but you get the idea is that we should decrease and God's work in us by his spirit should be increasing. And the increase ultimately will be evidenced by fruit so that we're not just people who are, you know, uh, experts at uh, critiquing sermons and radio programs and television programs that are Christian-based, but we are experts at reproducing ourselves, winning people to Christ, discipling them, equipping them, and then helping them to launch into ministry. So having said that, Jesus said that you will be filled with this power and you will be my witnesses. The word in Greek is martus, where we get our word martyr from. That's not the original, actually, even intent of that word. Martus means a witness. But so many Christians in the early church were dying because of their witness that they were referred to as martyrs. And martyr became a term that was associated with someone that was dying for a cause. And so they were to be witnesses. Now, what does a witness do? Well, they, they tell what they saw, what they heard, and what they experienced. And that's exactly what, what the gospel writer John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, um, when he said that, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, and which we've looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim. So that's our mission. We don't have to come up with any kind of fancy theology. We don't, have to, we don't have to know everything. All we have to do is tell what we've seen, what we've heard, and what we've actually experienced in our walk with God. And he said, you're to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the world. And remarkably, with this incredibly daunting task, it was completed within 30 years. The Bible tells us then, in closing of this section, that that Jesus was taken up before their very eyes and he was hidden from their sight in a cloud. I can just see the disciples, they're just thinking, I don't want to move, I don't want to leave. I mean, have you ever said goodbye to somebody you really love? At the, I remember um, having a girlfriend leave when I was in high school and go to the mainland. And uh, she wasn't even going to be gone that long, but it was like a semester. And I stood at that window for like, I watched the plane taxi. I watched it go, I watched it lift off. I watched it until I couldn't watch it anymore. And I just sat there and I was just heartbroken. And I watched that plane just go and go and go. And then it was gone and I was still standing there, you know. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know what I was expecting to have happen, but I just couldn't really move. And I think that's what was happening to the disciples is that they just couldn't, they couldn't move. And so these angels, you know, come up and say, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? There's, he's gone, you know? What are you gazing up into the sky for? And I think it was a, it kind of was a, a wake-up call saying, hey, okay, back to reality. There's a work to be done, and now you guys need to go and wait. But before they waited, these two angels made a promise that this same Jesus who left would come back in the same way that he went. He would return. How would he go? He would go in a cloud. How would he return? In a cloud. Uh, which again has to do with that Shekinah glory. It's all the Shekinah glory. Notice Jesus didn't go off until he, you know, turned into a little dot and then they couldn't see him anymore and vanished. No, he just was enclosed in, in or taken up in a cloud. You know, a lot of times we think of heaven as being in some other galaxy. Have you ever thought about that? Where is God anyway? Some other galaxy? I'll share something with you that we don't have any reason to believe or not believe. It's my speculation but I think heaven may just be on the other side of what we can't see. That there's a whole realm of spiritual warfare taking place right now. The demons are, are, are around this church, I'm sure, trying to attack it. They can't come in. They're trying to work in our lives. How are they doing it? From distant planets? No, I don't think so. I think they're right here. Where are the angels? I think the angels are right all around us. I think that they're just on the other side of what we can't see. A reality that we're not aware of, that we don't have capacity to understand visually yet. Where's God? Some distant galaxy, universe? I don't think so. The Bible says he's near. How near is he? I don't know. But he's near enough that he knows our prayers. He hears us. And he's ready at a moment's notice to meet our need. 
And so just as Jesus was taken, the Bible says he's going to come back. Where, where do we find him coming back again? Well, we find him coming back in the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. It says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in what? The clouds. So we're going to go up in the clouds. But the second coming of Christ is noted for us in many places. But in Revelation 1, it says, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. That's why I like cloudy days. I love days like today. I really enjoy, you know, days where there's no clouds at all because it's nice and warm, but I love it if I can just see even a little cloud somewhere on the horizon because I think, okay, it still could be today. And so just as Jesus left, the Bible says, he's going to return. In the meantime, we have an incredibly high calling to be like Jesus. I'll close with this verse in 1 John 2, 6. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. How can we possibly do that? Well, we do it in the very same way that Jesus did, but in our case, with the indwelling incarnation of the third person of the Trinity, the second incarnation. In the first, he you put the Mona Lisa in a Macy's bag. In the second, you put the Mona Lisa in a, in a dirty, worn out, holy Walmart bag. It's not the bag that counts. It's what's in the bag. And we have a precious treasure. I hope that if nothing else, you will realize the incredibly elevated position that we have in Christ. That this has very little to do with what we can do and everything to do with what we allow the Spirit to do. It has to do with dominance. What dominates our life? Is it ourselves, our own thoughts, our own plans, or is it the work of God? The more that God's work dominates our life, the more joy, the more fruit, the more power, the more presence of his work, all of these things, it's more and more and more. And the only thing stepping in between that dominance of the Holy Spirit in our life being filled is our own desires and our own thoughts that we think somehow will be somehow better if we do it our way. But if you're willing to lay that down this morning, you can be filled again. You can be consumed again and filled with passion for the things that God cares about. There's a work to be done. All the things that Jesus began to do and teach and now Jesus is continuing that work through the incarnation of the third person of the Trinity taking up residence in the hearts of men and women. We have a calling. We have a job to do. And our Savior will return and he will reward. I want your arms to be loaded with fruit because you were filled and available for his purposes in these last days. Father, we thank you for your word this morning and it's a real joy to gather together and to study. I thank you for the, the hunger that you've put in our hearts to know you, the patience of, of this church and the friends that are here this morning to hear your word, not a 15-minute sermon or a 20-minute sermon, but almost an hour long. And God, we're asking and crying out that you would have your way in us this morning. We look forward to partnering with you and Holy Spirit to allowing you to have your rightful place, not only as, as the one in our lives, but the one dominating our thoughts, consuming our minds, being the passion of our life, that we would be available to carry on the work that Christ began. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.